Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think everybody's in from the waiting room now. Um, so, welcome to our evening with Julia Samuel. This evening, Cathy Rensenbrick is going to interview Julia, which is lovely. Cathy's an author. She's written The Last Act of Love, Manual for Heartache, and her latest book is The Reader. In fact, we do have an event with Cathy as well, don't we? So that'll be lovely to look forward to. So this evening, um, this is a webinar, so you can't be seen and you can't be heard. Um, so, but to put your questions to, Kath, to Julia, which Cathy will ask on your behalf, please put them through the chat or the Q&A um, button at the bottom of the bar. Um, so we're all learning, so I hope you can all sort of find your way around this modern technology. So without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Cathy and Julia to Chorleywood Bookshop. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Hi, Thank you, Cheryl. And good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here with you and in this way that um, technology facilitates in these times that we live in. And it's a massive pleasure for me to be here with all of you and also to be here with Julia Samuel, uh, Saint Julia, as we know her. That, you know, it drives me nuts and couldn't be further than the truth. <laughs> exactly. So we're going to get into the life and books of Julia Samuel. So your first book, Julia, I'm just going to show Grief Works, um, a life changing book for me. And I don't understate it. When I took this off the shelf today, uh, the hardback, it's got a big post-it note on it that says guilt. <laughs> That's where I'd marked it. And then um, the book we're mainly going to talk about tonight, This Too Shall Pass, your second book. I wonder, could we start by you? Um, oh, and I also thought, of course, we, we talked about This Too Shall Pass before, haven't we? We talked at the Freud Museum. I mean, almost, in, it was, I think it was the last real life outing I had. I've basically sort of been in, haven't been further than six miles from my house since. Um, it was about the 10th of March, wasn't it? Something yeah. Like it was literally just about a week before lockdown, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, all of us have gone very short distances since then. Yes, and of course it's a book about change, and so presumably when you, you were writing it, you weren't aware that there was about to be a global imposition of, uh, of something that would cause change for everyone, I guess. No, certainly not. I mean, the... The kind of strange paradox is that the, my thesis in my book is that life is change and that it's the only certainty along with our death. Mm -hmm. And that um, anybody who came through my door as a client, whatever their presenting issue was, they had a problematic relationship with change. Mm -hmm. And those that blocked change um, and resisted it ha had a much harder time when they try to kind of fight it or will their way through it. And those that didn't kind of anesthetize or block themselves from it and supported themselves and were self-compassionate, they were able to grow with it and through it um, and, and have more joy and thrive in life. I think the thing about the pandemic, it does kind of two things. I think it reminds us in a way that is extremely unwelcome that fundamentally we don't have control over the things that matter to us most you know our mortality and um illness we we can influence them but we we don't have control and i think we also i think the thing about the 21st century is that we have a full sense of our agency and control that we can do if we can afford it we can do more or less whatever we want that we can buy an aeroplane ticket, uh, um, sort of Sainsbury's order, you know, an Uber, you know, you can do everything very fast. And the, and the wake up call from the pandemic was that really what matters to us most is the love and connection to others. And that was taken from us. Um, and there are many things that we don't have control over. Mm. Yep, a wake-up call, as you say. Could you take us back um, to the, not the beginning of you as a person, but maybe the beginning to you as a therapist, maybe just um, contextualise your career for us and how you started off? I think, I mean, I think that this kind of early influence for me as a therapist was that I was the daughter of parents 
who never talked about feelings or anything that mattered. They were very much parents of their generation. Like most people of my age, their parents believed that you should, you know, um, forget and move on and put on a stiff upper lip. But actually they had had five very significant deaths very on in life. So my mother, by the time she was 25, her mother, her father, her only sister and her only brother had died. Mm -hmm. And um, my father, his father and his brother. So there were these kind of six photographs, black and white photographs around the house of very significant people, but they were never talked about. So there was this kind of above the waterline kind of slight brittleness and lots of happiness and fun things. But there was a sense of things that weren't being spoken about. And I think I learned very young that I was always more interested in what was going on beneath mm. what people were saying and saying that they were okay when clearly they weren't. Um, and I think that influenced me to go into therapy. And um, I went, I, my first job was at St. Mary's Paddington where I supported families for 25 years um, who had babies and children that died. Mm. So that was the kind of mother and father of, for me as a therapist, and I still have a link with St. Mary's and I feel enormous loyalty and connection with St. Mary's. And of course it gave me, you know, I felt like sitting in my room it's, to begin with like a broom cupboard with no window. And finally I got a room with a window, which felt like I'd been given a kind of Nobel prize, um, <laughs> was that I traveled thousands of miles because 60 different languages are spoken in the hospital every day. So I had an enormous amount of experience of trying to get inside the um, experiences and difficulties and culture and complexities of everybody I work with. And you tell us a little bit about the paradox of grief that you worked out in those years. In those early years. And I think it's still the paradox of change too, is the, the sort of central paradox is that the more that I can find a way of accepting the reality that I don't want to accept that this person has died or that this um, pandemic is present and alive, as it were, um, the more likely it is that change will occur. Mm -hmm. So there's this pull and push between um, what you think you can um, what you can accept, which I accept it with grief, accept isn't really the word that we use now. It's more like accommodation. You can find a way of living with. And the more you don't fight it, allow yourself to feel the pain of it, allow that pain to change you and shift your internal relationship with what's happened, then you're more likely to heal. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I mean, it makes loads of sense. I was talking to a friend who's struggling this morning and I was basically just quoting you at them. <laughs> um, and I told them the, the thing that, that I read, I, I think it's in the introduction to grief works. This was the life changing sentence for me is you talk about grief as the tug of war between the pain of loss and the instinct to survive. And I feel a lot of people are on the end of fairly unhelpful if well-meaning advice that um you know time heals I, I felt i was always told that well you might feel awful now but after a while you'll be back to normal and i think actually that's the opposite of what's true it, it it's more it's more that if you accept that you'll never you know i used to wait for my factory settings to be restored and it was actually in real life, it was in accepting that that would never happen that i actually began to take interest in a, a new life, that there was a new life to live, not the one I'd wanted, not the one I'd asked for, but there was a new life there. And I just, I th think I speak to so many people and I tell them you're that thing about the tug of war between the pain of loss and the instinct to survive. I think it makes huge transformative sense for people. And that push and pull between the past and the future. I mean, there's so many dialectics, aren't they, of mm -hmm. what you want and what you can't have. And, you know, I, I think we, we were brought up you know, I was brought up to believe that you forget and move on, like get over it, you get over things, don't make a fuss, um, get on with it. And, you know, all the research now, and there's much more knowledge now than there ever was 30 years ago. That's one of the great things of the 21st century is that we have a lot more good evidence-based research of what people actually experience and what they feel. And what is recognized now is continuing bonds. 
that the person may have died um, or the event may have happened like COVID. And we have to face that reality. We have to experience and express the pain of that reality. And the relationship never dies. So this is where it doesn't really work with COVID, but with a person that's died, the love never dies. So you will love them forever. So you with your brother, Matty, you could have a conversation with him in your mind from now until you're, you know, a hundred mm -hmm. and you would connect to him and you love him. And maybe you love him more than when he was alive. You know, that the, the connection to him is sort of touchstones to memory that you need to engage with him. And you can do it by talking to your mum and dad or your friends or looking at a photo or cooking his favourite meal or walking a walk you always walked or and that that is how we heal and that over time at the beginning of loss it's like all there is it completely absorbs all of us and it's completely preoccupying and there's loops of different stories and battles and fixations that we have going around in our head. And over time, if we don't block them, so it's the things that we do to block the pain that do us harm over time. And you talked a lot about that in your book. Um, and we support ourselves and give ourselves compassion. Over time, we adjust. And so the, the level of the pain doesn't change, but we build our life around it. So there's many layers of experiences and life that then feels like really living and engaging with life. And the person can come front of mind because of a memory or a time of year, but then they go back to back of mind. So the intensity of the pain does change if you do the work, um, but uh, you will always feel a loss at a particular time. And so that doesn't change. And tell us more about um, this idea that um, everyone wants to avoid discomfort, don't we? We all want to avoid pain. Why do we run so hard away from pain when that actually, it turns out, is the thing that will then create a very long tail of suffering? I mean, I think it's human. <laughs> I should have an answer. I mean, I think it's human that we, and I think it's particularly, again, 21st human, that we kind of want the fast track app. You know, we want everything that will make it sorted and will make it quickly that we'll, you know, that we'll get through this quickly. I think one of the terrible things about yesterday's announcement, what was like, we kind of, we, we allowed ourselves six months or three months. And then this thing that you don't know how long something is and that you have to kind of sit and endure it. We are used to speed in the 21st century. I think it's a new, it's a, a new relationship with suffering. So, you know, really up until the second world war, grief and suffering was absolutely an accepted part of life. I mean, there were plenty of people who drank their way avoiding it, but it wasn't like you were failing or that you weren't living your best life because you were in pain. It was <clears throat> that suffering was part of life. Mm -hmm. And now I think we have a kind of attitude that somehow I'm doing it wrong if I'm suffering. But actually, if you think about yourself in experiences, the small experiences of um, uh, in a job, and I mean, they're not, this isn't necessarily small, it might be big, but you find yourself feeling more and more kind of irritable in your job, that you kind of feel a bit bored in your job. And those are the first signals of discomfort to tell you change is afoot. Yes. I need to think about something else. And of course, those signals are the um, awareness that I need to pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. And so I need to think about maybe where I'm going to work or what I'm going to do or the retraining I'm going to have. And people often ignore them because it doesn't suit them. It's a pain, not one, you know, literally a pain. And, um, but we, it is how we know that we need to shift our understanding, our internal understanding. I do think the life-changing sentence in this book for me is pain is the agent of change because that's very transformative when you can clock that isn't it if you can really if you can re if you can internalize that as a thought then that then that really helps is that do you think is that central to a lot of your work is that what you're trying to show people I sound like, so i'm so far from saint julia aren't I? i'm the one that's saying suffer 
Suck it up. <laughs> Suck it up. Don't make a fuss. Get on with it. I think what I'm saying is that we need to pay attention to ourselves mm -hmm. and what's going on in ourselves and treat it with compassion and honesty and not distract ourselves with busyness um, or all the other things that we block ourselves because then we live in much more alignment with our internal experience and our external world when we don't listen to the discomfort and it, there's a spectrum of discomfort so you have real pain one end and you have joy the other end and you know it's anywhere along that spectrum that we experience but when you ignore those small or bigger signals we're doing ourselves a disservice and when we block them if you block your pain you incrementally block your capacity to feel so you block your capacity to feel joy. So you function fine, but your experience and expansion to be able to get engage with life is diminished. And so we, all of us know many people who you kind of knock on their <laughs> chest and you kind of think, is anybody in? Because you know, they have a very fixed view of life and they keep that view and they're, you know, right about it and they've done the same thing or, you know, I mean, I'm unbelievably habitual. So having written a book about change, I'm not good with change. I don't like change very much. I eat the same breakfast, you know, most <laughs> days of the week, things like that. I'm um, but, and I do the same exercise, different breakfast and different exercise on different days. So I, I do things that help me see, feel safe, given that lots of other things are very chaotic. Mm. But um, if we block our capacity to feel, then we block our engagement with life, is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Mm -hmm. so. um, can we talk a bit about, um, you also say trying to avoid unhappiness means it will last longer, which is obviously, well, I mean, is it obvious? It now feels very obvious to me, but, uh, but of course it didn't used to. Could you just talk a little bit to that? I think it's the same thing, is that you, you, you're blocking your openness to new experiences and um, to, to be different and evolve. I mean, what, what we know from the research is that change tends to happen every seven to 10 years. And so the seven year itch is a thing. <laughs> um, and that when we, we block it, they ha people have less joy and less success in life. Um, and when change comes around again, it hits them harder. So that's what I mean by that, is that a new experience is a build-up because the body remembers, the body holds the score. So, you know, 80% of decision-making comes from our experience, not our logic. The sort of Descartian idea of, you know, I think this and I feel that, that the, but the two are completely interconnected. So if you're narrowing that down all the time and then every new experience that comes, you, it reminds your body of discomfort and suffering and so it builds on it. And so you get more and more kind of miserable. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a bit about marriage? Um, I was <laughs> reading out some bits about marriage to my husband today. Yeah. I, read the, I read him the bit um, about how we live for a hundred years these days, but marriage was designed when people only lived for 40 years. He sort of looked at me like, is this, is this a we need to talk moment? <laughs> I love the way in the book you say, you've had five different marriages all to the same man. Perhaps you'd talk to us a bit about that. So, um, well, the five marriages to the same man, I've been married 40 years. And so I got married very young. So we've had lots of different phases. And, you know, what the research shows about marriage is that finding the one isn't, is a kind of wonderful fairy tale, but unlikely to predict your, your sort of good, um, good enough marriage. I, I mean, I think the idea of this sort of perfect skipping into the sunset, I think everybody knows isn't going to happen, although it's still in every single film that you see. Mm, and all these people keep getting married, even we know half of them will get divorced. Yeah. But less people are divorced now because less people are getting married. Ah, right. Um, but what... So my, our five marriages were kind of 
very different phases. You know, the first 10 years was having children um, and trying to work and trying to kind of get to know each other. Um, and then my next 10 years, I made him do so many terrible therapy things because I was learning to be a therapist. And when you're a therapist and I was going to meetings and, you know, I made him do every time I came home from a weekend course on how to communicate or sex or um, uh, culture, I would sit him down or walk with him and kind of make prod him, you know, <laughs> so he had to go through all these terrible things. With me. And then I would drag him off to courses masses of courses in all over the place. And he'd never, he'd always kind of say yes, which always amazed me. And then he'd get there and he'd suddenly realize he was doing this kind of weirdo course with lots of weird people standing in a circle and chanting. <laughs> Anyhow, I mean, so, and then there was, you know, next 10 years, our children began to grow up and leave home and be university. And so they, we've gone through different phases and now all our children are married and they've all got children and we kind of live on our own. And we work, we both work from home now. So we're in another completely different phase. Um, and I think the thing that kind of predicts our outcome is if you, there's a, there's a, a checkbox list done by Professor Barlow, which is um, 10 questions you should ask someone you're going to kind of choose to commit to. And it's basically, are we a good fit? Do we, are we kind to each other? Do we have similar values? Do we sort our arguments out? So it's never about not having a fight. Everybody has fights. It's about how you repair after the fight. Because if you um, never sort out the fight, it's building up like a pile of poo that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And every fight brings back all the other fights. Mm. Um, and... I mean, for us, our, probably our single best tip thing that we do is we walk and talk. Mm -hmm. So when we're happy, when we're cross, when we're worried, we go for a walk and we talk. I mean, I do that with the children too. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes they ask me to go for a walk and I think, oh my God, what's happened? And sometimes it's just they want to go for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and tell us, so you organised the book into these categories, the, the, the different categories of meanings of life. Um, work is another one. I often think that we really underestimate the potential negative impact of work on a people. How, how distressing it can be pe for people when things go wrong in the workplace. And that often as a society, we might not be as understanding of that as we might be of something that, that feels more... Uh, you know, more more obvious. I think there are things. I'm always interested in this hierarchy of suffering. There are things that people like uh, Maslow's hierarchy uh, of needs. Exactly. Yeah. I think there are things that people easily understand and feel sympathetic about, and then there are things that I think must be very brutal and people are less sympathetic about. And I often feel that some of those things come under the heading of work. I wondered if that was your and work and identity seem to be so cl closely linked yeah. to lots of people. So, I mean, Freud, I think, got it right when he said love and work, work and love, that's all there is, that we need both, that we, you know, the single most important thing for our health, our wealth, our happiness, our longevity and not suffering in old age and all of that is, is love and connection, having lots of love and connection in our life. But we also need work. Working is good for us. We're kind of made to work. And... Um, those that don't work or have a bad, people who have a difficult time at work, often it's because they have very little autonomy. Um, mm. But we need to work because we need, I mean, I think that's one of the difficult things with lockdown is I think the shift of transition of your being from home to work is a very important one where you become your work identity, which is always slightly different. And we get our structure, our purpose, and our meaning from work and often work with some people fills in the holes that other aspects of life can't do or they may feel you know I'm really not that good at talking about how I feel or relationships or kind of socializing but I'm really brilliant at my job and so that gives you enough esteem and confidence that allows you to manage the things that you find difficult so you're right that when um, work goes wrong it can be truly um, uh, 
very, very problematic for people and they create real suffering. And of course, particularly, I think more now than ever, work, we spend longer at work than anywhere else. And with our phones and always being online and always being accessible, we are, the boundary between work and home has got thinner and thinner. And I, I think that creates real damage. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, one of the things I often do with clients is I really create, and I do it with lockdown too, a kind of um, ritual to have at the end of your day. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever time that day you decide that you need to work, that you do something and you have an ending, mm -hmm. because you need an ending to have a beginning, to step from one version of yourself into the other. Otherwise, often you take your kind of dregs home, but your relationships really matter. So you use your best at work, and then the, the dregs go home and you need to have more um, sort of good habits so that you have enough energy for home. And what and the key part of that is having time boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a sort of a shutdown ritual. Because yeah. I, you know, again, as a self-employed writer person. And in a funny way... Um, I like the way you call yourself a self-employed writer person. <laughs> really acclaimed brilliant author <laughs> and teacher and podcaster yeah it's very it's and it's wonderful and i love the richness of my life but the the utter temptation is that it all bleeds into the same thing and i don't know where i don't know and in some ways that, that i think is the it's the unavoidable consequence of making your hobby into your job and i think that the people i know that really struggle with work-life boundaries I would say broadly come into two categories. Those who absolutely love what they do and kind of secretly would rather be performing at the top of their game than maybe not that secretly than emptying the dishwasher because they've got to make their kids breakfast that they're not going to appreciate. <laughs> Wonder who I could be talking about there. <laughs> and then the other category being people who don't like their jobs but have not been able to boundary off their sense of dissatisfaction to that so that they become very emotionally you know, so that they don't and are driven by fear that they're going to fail. So they have to keep kind of, yeah. I mean, it, I don't know how accurate the research is, but there's some Gallup research that I saw showed that only 10% of people really hate their job. 13% mm. um, of people love their job and 40% of people like their job. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the big change in the workplace and for us societally is women working. So, you know, 50 years ago, I think probably 10% of women work. And now it's, you know, as many women as men work. Mm -hmm. um, of course, they don't get paid as much and they do much more part-time work because of child rearing and all of those difficult questions that are not by any means answered structurally. But I think that's shifted a lot of our, it, it's, it's, it means that a lot of our societal norms have become much more fluid and much and very, very different. Mm -hmm. Which is exciting, but then also anxiety inducing, isn't it? For everyone, I think. And I, I, I mean, I think one of the things w w that I kind of researched and talked about in my book is that we do now have many more choices, you know, than somebody, a woman like me had 50 years ago. And that is exciting and expanding. And I think, we want expansion in life rather more than happiness. You know, you want to kind of feel that you're on the edge of your comfort zone where you're kind of being tested and you're learning and you're growing through what, through the life that you're engaging with. And that there's so many rules that we can break of, of um, relationships, of gender, of sexuality, and, you know, the kind of fixed institutions of marriage and... Um, work have all become much more fluid and open to us but I think that gives us ma many of us an existential crisis mm -hmm. which is why you know books like the 10 rules of life or whatever it was I think people want they kind of you know it used to be the 10 commandments but I think people want a kind of guideline what are going to be what are going to be the things that guide me in my life given that I have all these choices and not of course not everybody has all these choices there's a, a, a big section of society that has no choices but I hope in the book that through the sections of family love work health and identity that people by listening to other not listening or listening on the audible but reading other people's stories 
I think the most personal is the most universal. And I hope that they can find their values and their beliefs about what matters to them by disagreeing or agreeing or being curious of looking at this, the people I work with and their dilemmas and what they wrestled with and how they came out the other side of them. And for me, that is completely fascinating. It Obviously, is. I wouldn't do it otherwise. Well, yes, and it's extremely fascinating to, to, to read about it. Um, how do you, um, when people sort of, when people come to see you first, when you, do, do you? I love that, that first session. Oh, that's really what I want to ask about. Tell us about what happened. I was thinking, because like, when I ring up the GP, my GP does this thing now. You've got to tell the receptionist what's wrong with you, which is quite efficient because then they, and it is, I mean, it's very efficient. You can talk to a doctor quite quickly, but I still feel a bit embarrassed telling the receptionist. And, I, and it made me think about how, uh, I was thinking about it today because of phoning the doctor, and it made me think about when people phone you up. Presumably you don't say, what's the problem then? No. <laughs> what's it starting? <laughs> I mean, you get such a, obviously with everybody, you can get so many different varieties, but you they, they go into kind of three categories. You go into the category where I get an email where it's sort of 10 pages where I get the story of their life, of everything that's gone wrong and that they want it fixed. Or I get a two liner, like I want to see you, no, nothing. I don't get anything at all. Um, or I, I get a kind of short paragraph about some terrible thing that's happened and that they're not, you know, that they're suffering. And what I love about that first session is the not knowing. Like, you know, they, I, I, I always imagine what someone looks like and I nearly always get that wrong. So as they walk through the door, they, I, they, people have to come up four flights of stairs because my lift, I'm always terrified they're going to get locked in the lift. So, I mean, every patient I have, they make a comment about the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> like is it a test does everybody find this difficult <laughs> anyway <laughs> but th when I see them and they come and sit down then I give them a moment to kind of gather themselves and it, fe it feels like you are entering into kind of the Narnia's cupboard you're going into the internal world of someone you have never met and they have never met you and through that you find their treasure and their um, injuries and their confusions. And it's an incredible privilege to kind of walk through. And often there are lots of barriers, so I can't get to the treasure straight away, but I have to work out what the barrier is and what's going on and not push or push a bit more. Or... So the attuning to them and building a relationship of trust, because that you know all the research shows, whatever model of therapist you are, it's it's, the relationship that predicts the outcome if if the the client believes and feels that you've got them I think that's the thing when people feel like I've got them and that I'm on their side but not colluding on their side like I'll I'll kind of push or I'll disagree or I'll challenge but they know that I've got their best interests at heart that I really want them to thrive and I want them to find a way of living with the terrible pain of someone dying or the difficulty they're in or the separation they're going through or the infertility they've got. And it feels like an amazing, I mean, that's what I really love is building relationships. Mm -hmm. Love it. And is there any, and this may be a stupid question, so apologies, but is there any kind of average time that you see people or do you, and do you have a sense, do you ever, do you get a sense of people of like, Oh, this might be quite quick or actually we're going to be years on this one. I mean, is there anything like that? Sorry if it's silly and facile, but I do think this is the stuff people are interested in. No, I don't think that's silly at all. Sometimes what people present with isn't the real difficulty. Mm. So people might come because um, they're 50 and their children are leaving home and they kind of want to know what to do with this next chapter of their life. But actually, it turns out that they were abused as a child. They've never been able to have intimate relationships. Um, so the, the kind of measurement of how long you see someone is adverse child experiences. The more adverse child experiences you've had and the younger you have them, the more significant the psychological injuries are. And they can be kind of 
lack of contact. So it doesn't always have to be terrible, terrible things, but it can be, anyway, I won't go into that, but so that will predict a longer process. Whereas somebody is, it, if it's a single event experience and they have lots of love around them. So for grieving, and I think in the process of change for this too shall pass, the people who have the most support at the time and following the loss, whether it's a living loss like now or a loss from death, have the best outcomes. Mm. So when bad things happen to us, it's the love and connection to others that makes the difference. So if they have lots of that, but they need to kind of process something that's very difficult, then I probably won't see them for that long, six months to a year. I think the terrible paradox, not paradox, the terrible aspect of COVID is the thing that enables us to manage life's difficulties is the thing we're being told we can't do. Mm -hmm. Social distancing, I think, is creating real psychological harm throughout the UK. So people who already have a diagnosis or a mental anxiety or, or you know, difficulty, they'll be feeling much worse. People who had a little bit, it might become full blown. People with obsessive compulsive disorders, people in difficult marriages, and they can't go and do all the things that normally help them regulate. And I hear this every single day. And um, I think we're storing up lots of problems for the future. And for our young people, you know, I don't think, I mean, I don't think so much children under 10, I don't, I don't really know about this, but I worry for teenagers and young people a lot. Yeah, me too. Is there, I mean, is there anything that can be done? Well, I mean, I think you have to kind of really um, build on the relationships that you do have so that you really use them. And you know, Zoom isn't the best thing in the world, but it's a lot better than nothing. So I think some people kind of got exhausted by Zoom and gave up, but actually I think you get much more into a, a kind of whirlpool of despair if you don't have connection with people. Yeah. So- I group stuff quite hard. So again, in, I, one individual is so important to me and I now have like scheduled calls with friends again where we basically take it in turns to download everything but when I've and again it's all very well-meaning any group stuff I've done not like not events like this but kind of like family get-togethers I always end up feeling a little bit anxious and I, I don't quite understand why that is but I just don't feel it's it's good because you don't in a usual like in a you know a cousin's birthday or whatever you'd normally splinter off into little groups and have little chats whereas it all feels very I think it becomes very performative, even as a family that is a very good functioning family. And you kind of, it becomes quite shallow. Whereas one-to-one, -one, like you and I talking now, I'm not really aware of the people that are watching. I mean, I am kind of aware of it, but I'm much more aware of you mm -hmm. and our relationship and how we are with each other. Um, you can have proper int intimacy. You can have proper contact. I think the other thing is that if people are suffering, the earlier they have an intervention, the sooner they get help, the better their outcome. So yeah. don't be brave and um, kind of hope that it's going to go away, but actually get some help. And there's a lot of online support, much more than there ever was before. There's lots of COVID related online support. And I think the thing that helps most people, in, and I think winter is scaring them, but I think we still need to do it is exercise. Any yeah. kind of exercise, whether it's fast walking, whether it's running, whether it's cycling, whether it's doing something on Zoom in your sitting room or your bathroom, that moving your body around shifts your mood. It shifts yes. the cortisol in your body. It tells you you've, you've flown or fought. Um, and it gives you more bandwidth to then connect with people or do the things that you want to do. If you stay not moving at all, again, your, your thinking and cognitive part goes offline mm. and then you can get into real spirals. Mm. The other big thing that you know all the research shows is that helping other people is very good for your immune but also it makes you feel better. So when you feel really bad helping others is actually probably the best thing you can do whether it's phone support of getting food for your neighbor, 
making things, whatever it is, that makes a big difference. And then choosing to do things that soothe you, you know, choosing to listen to a good playlist, make a good playlist or um, watching a comedy. So if you think everything that you ingest, what you eat, who you see, what you listen to, whether you move or you don't move, um, every sense of your body, what you see, eat, hear, um, smell, affects your mood. So do it kind of mindfully that do the things that soothe you, not wind you up. So like watching the news, if you have to watch the news, watch it once a day or on your app, because news is contagious. It totally fires up your fight or flight. Mm -hmm. So some people are constantly watching the news all day and by the end of the day, they feel completely bonkers. Do you feel that that is a bit gender? So I don't think I'm low. Well, I know I'm not low because I talk about this with all my friends. I know a lot of couples where, and it, it is gendered like this. The woman has basically just decided, okay, this is all awful, but I mean, I've got the kids to look after. We've got to carry on trying to earn money. So I'm just going to paddle my own canoe for a bit and hope for the best. But the man is sort of disrupting this plan because he's looking at news on his phone from dawn till dusk. <laughs> I don't know whether that's just the freakish coincidence of all the people I know. I mean, if you look at the model of, of loss, whatever the loss is, a living loss like this, we have two tendencies, loss orientation to focus on the grief, to um, allow ourselves to feel the pain, to kind of connect with it, and restoration orientation, to be okay, to get on, to move forward, to survive. And that we need to oscillate between the two. So we need to give ourselves time to grieve and feel the pain, like I always talk about. But we also need to give ourselves time to have a break from grief, do the things that I was talking about, of doing fun things, connecting, distracting yourself. Men tend to be restorative. So men tend, in a couple, to want to get on, to look to the future, to survive. Women tend to be loss-oriented. So they often are kind of Sherlock Holmes obsessing and looping. Um, which doesn't exactly fit with what you're saying, but I think it's men's tendency to look out and look to see what's coming, to see what you need to do from a kind of primitive um, um, evolutionary biology perspective. Interesting stuff. Um, lovely audience, I'm going to start coming to you for questions soon, so do put them in the Q&A box for me. Judy, one of the incredibly useful things about your book, I mean, it's all wonderful, but I did find the section on the eight pillars of strength really practically helpful. I wonder if you'd just talk about that a little bit. So I developed the eight pillars of strength because when we are going through a process of change, it feels like something hits us and it, you know, change isn't linear. It, does, it doesn't just not go in one direction. It can feel like a wave and it stops and it starts and it has a pattern and a life of its own. And we often experience that chaotically inside and we feel kind of very scared and we feel like we're on this roller coaster. And so I designed the pillars of strength to give us, like the architectural pillars in a building, pillars that can hold us together when we feel like our world is off kilter. And so the eight pillars are the relationship with yourself is key and that influences every other relationship that you have. And for the central part of it is to be self-compassionate. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people turn their distress against themselves and they have what I call a shitty committee where they attack themselves. And the key is to be as kind to yourself as you would a friend. I like the way you, sweat, you, you smile when I swear. It's like really grown up. I do, but I was because I was telling one of my writing clients about the shitty committee the other day. Oh, were you? I endlessly quote you. All my, everybody I know just endlessly is on the receiving end of your wisdom and your way of expressing yourself, which I love. Um, um, the other one, thank you. I'll take, I'll take that. Do my own teaching, take my own medicine. <laughs> yeah, the other one is your relationship with others. That That is... You know, those two are the kind of really key pe pillars, the relationship with yourself, relationship with others, that we need to give them time and effort and compassion and attention. And if we ignore them, it's very difficult for the other things to work. The other one is your mind and body, that 
you know, the body remembers, the body holds the score. And so that we need to give ourselves regular exercise and look after our body and do things that calm it down, that kind of and listen to our bodies, all of that kind of stuff, that we need structure, not like a police state. So I think now people, if they're going to be locked down again, so I saw people yesterday who were very worried about the winter, you know, they were right in the summer because they had that garden and they had things that preoccupied them. These are people who aren't working, who are older and living alone. But I was saying to create a, a small structure so that you feel like you have moments in your day that you've done what you need to do. Um, and that again gives you a much more feeling of agency. Mm. Um, the other ones are focusing that you kind of do things to breathing to calm yourself down. And I can't remember what the other one is. I haven't even got my book. I will say I live and by I live by my routines now, which again yeah. my younger self would have just found that incredible. I'm so not a routine person, but especially when things do get a bit challenging, I just actually what I do I, I think you might have told me to do this or it might be written in one of your books I can't remember what I did most recently was I wrote a list of all the things I couldn't control and Good. then I wrote the things I can control and what I the, the list of what I couldn't control was long and difficult but the list of what I can control included what I put in my body how I move my body how I choose to think how kind I am to the people who live in my house um, and then I really then those I, are huge each of those is huge yeah. And I, I straight away started to feel better. And I just thought, yeah, all this other stuff, I'm just not having it in, my, you know, I'm just not having it on my load. I can't afford it in the rucksack at the moment. No. And yeah, and then I minutely plan out, I, I plan the day to, as you say, factor in some little treats, tiny things, five minutes of yoga first thing, but then I tick it and it just makes me feel good. And, and the yoga, you know, the five minutes of, you know, so I think this thing of kind of mindfulness meditation puts everybody off because they think you have to find nirvana and you're going to find this sort of inner chi that is going to take you to a higher state. Literally just breathing, breathing in for seven and out for 11 for five minutes mm -hmm. brings your whole system down. It, it reduces your levels of stress. So just do little, little bite sized chunks. And I think that thing of turn, you know, acknowledge the difficulty, but turn to the sun, you know, that you, like you did, you did the list of what's bad. So you're not ignoring it. You're kind of giving it its place. You're not pretending it's not there, but then you turn to the positive where you can have agency and control and feel good. And that literally changes your day. Mm -hmm. And that whole thing of keeping it in the day as well, like not projecting the future so that was my other pillar actually is time that your relationship with time is altered when you're in a process of change and one of the big things is to most process of change take longer than anybody wants um, and that the sort of shift from where you are now to where you're going to be often there's a kind of fertile void a time of not knowing and you need to let yourself have that fertile void but also your relationship with time is changed that you may be hankering for the for the past like most of us you know are, are when we had freedom as it were um but really if you focus your attention on the day today that is incredibly helpful a recent um we've got lots of nice questions um but a recent thing i said to a struggling friend was i told them about the um the, the thing you do in aa in recovery which is just for today yeah that's brilliant found that incredibly helpful just you know to stop panicking about what might lie in the future um i put that poem on my instagram and it had the most kind of spread than anything i've ever done on instagram um so uh joe is asking you mentioned teens are having a particularly bad time with the pandemic what can we do as parents or relatives to help them um that's a really good question i think some of it so one of idea that that I've suggested it seems to work with some families that you have the equivalent of a Cobra meeting, not that often, but that you sit down or you can walk and talk this or sit down the table and all of you kind of agree what's difficult, mm -hmm. agree what you can do and what you can contribute to. And I think the more kind of collaborative we are with teenagers so that they don't feel like imposed on all the time and that they have their own spaces, um, and opportunities to walk and talk with you. I mean, 
one of the big fights is often about um, uh, screens. And if there is another lockdown, I would say don't fight about screens. They need to be with their peers. Mm -hmm. So let them be with their peers, but also let them contribute so that you have a family system. So families that kind of are good enough, which is always what we're going for, we're never looking for like perfect families, are those that have more positive engagements and connections than negative. It's not about not having any negative ones. And for young people and teenagers, it's um, giving them opportunities to kind of be themselves, be difficult, have a tantrum, um, hold the boundary so that they have it to hit against, but also opportunities to, to do things that are connecting that you can enjoy together. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was lovely and very helpful and I scribbled lots down for personal use. I hope that answers your, your, her, your question. Yeah, I mean, there's masses about teenagers. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think the other thing is if they use their creativity, that helps them a lot. Um, they're amazingly creative. This is a really interesting question. Have you ever had a client that you failed to help? Yes, I have. I've had a couple of clients that really scared me. One I felt was kind of violent and I, I don't know that he was, but he really scared me. So I stopped seeing him and I have had some clients who for whatever reason, I just, I wasn't the right person, I think, or I didn't get it properly. I didn't get them properly um, and I didn't help them. And that's a, it's a horrible feeling. Mm -hmm. It's a horrible feeling, but certainly. Yeah. Um, and another question, how do you help someone whose problems just won't go away, making them feel that change isn't possible? Well, I think one of the things to look at is what is your underlying belief system? So what are you defining as a problem? How are you framing it, your perception for yourself? Mm -hmm. um, maybe there's a possibility if someone is constantly having dramas and you know difficulties that are kind of seem out of their control, I would wonder about had they experienced trauma because trauma changes the brain and it changes your engagement with life. And often you seek the intensity if you've mm -hmm. um, had a traumatic experience that's still kind of unprocessed in you. And that means that you're, you have less impulse control that you can fight more, you can drink more, and then the things that happen around you become more out of your control and then you have a more troubled life. So I'd, I'd look at that. Um, and the truth is life is not fair. And I, you know, I have had clients where they've had two children die. I mean, you would never think that was ever could ever happen. Um, and so there are some people who, you know, bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people and helping them find a way of coming to terms with that is incredibly difficult and complex, but you can't fight that. Mm -hmm. And Victoria is saying, could you speak more about how you feel grief is delayed or put on hold because of the impact of COVID? So, I mean, I th there's lots of, about this that I think about. One is that it's very likely to be sudden and traumatic because, you know, the, the onset of the illness is day one and maybe they're in hospital by day seven or day eight. And it could well be someone who was very healthy or someone who was managing an underlying condition extremely well. And then suddenly they're in hospital and then you're not allowed to visit them. So it's surreal and you have all that nightmare of trying to get through to the hospital, trying to find out what's going on. And the, what we imagine is often more frightening than what we actually know. And then in many cases of people I've worked with, you know, their parent or their partner has died and they've watched it on a screen held by a nurse. So they haven't had an ending. They haven't had the opportunity to say goodbye. They don't have memories of it being peaceful of holding their hand. So that is unbelievably traumatic. And then of course, the funeral is often delayed. And then there are some people who have Zoom funerals or if not Zoom, they have very small funerals with five or 10 people. 
So that thing I said about outcomes of love and connection to others, people aren't having that contact of everyone coming around to their house and bringing lasagna. They may bring lasagna, but they don't come in. So you don't have the support. And so the every kind of lens that you look at the, 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 the grief, it's the, the suddenness and out of the blue. It's the distance and the kind of regrets about what you couldn't do at the time. It's the imagination of not knowing. And then it's having a kind of dismal funeral that doesn't seem real. So all of that makes it unreal and surreal and suspends the grieving. So, because the task of mourning is facing the reality of the, of the death. And for that reality, we need the experience of it. So if you touch someone that's died and they're cold, you can't not know that they're dead. And as difficult as that is, that's a very important aspect of your grieving. So, you know, from the First World War, people, none of them were repatriated. And so often all the, the family members of people who were killed in the First World War always expected them to walk through the door because they had... Um, no bodies, no images, no representations to, to let themselves know the reality of it. Is there anything that you feel, um, you know, with all that in mind, is there any uh, sort of advice, any mitigating advice you can offer us? I mean, it's all very hard, isn't it? So I think developing rituals in the, in the hub that you've got um, to represent what's happened. So maybe lighting a candle or putting flowers in a particular place. Um, talking to people about the person that's died, writing the person letters, writing to them saying what you wished. Journaling really helps. Mm -hmm. um, obviously not now, but at some time it would be very helpful to have a gathering that is bigger or where you can really witness and acknowledge the importance of the person that died and feel like you can both acknowledge the death and celebrate their life in a way that represents your love for them. And the other thing is that if you have traumatic grief to get support early, the longer you leave it, um, the more harm it does. And trauma, you, it would be normal to have flashbacks and not sleep and have a lot of disturbance six weeks after a death. And there isn't an exact line, but six or seven weeks, if you're still having flashbacks and disturbed sleeping and you can't concentrate and you kind of feel jittery and panicky, um, then that is more likely to be PTSD. So you should get EMDR as the best treatment for PTSD. And the other thing is exercise again. So, cause it feels like fear in your body grief. So walk, walk and talk with someone if you can, kind of do things that wind your body down, that soothe you, that kind of intentionally calm you and, um, help you feel safe because you feel like you've been thrown into this very alien place mm -hmm. and you have so it's true do you we've only got a couple of minutes left sadly because i feel i could um stay here until the end of time listening to you, you <laughs> i wonder do you um do you sort of believe in the notion of post-traumatic growth right. and if you do is can you see any positive outcomes societally potentially for this period? That's a really good question actually. I, I have seen post-traumatic growth so what I understand as post-traumatic growth is that it never diminishes or kind of makes less the level of the loss or the enormity of the trauma you know whether it was someone dying of Covid in this terrible way or a car crash or whatever the circumstances but what um, has been researched and what I have seen with clients is that people who can find a way of um, adapting and accommodating the, the terribleness of the loss, let themselves be changed by it. So have that paradoxical theory of grief that they find them, their healing. The, what the growth feels like is that their perception of themselves, their perception of what matters in the world and their perception of their engagement with the world grows and changes and they would say that was like growth that it felt like growth so they feel like they survived something that they never would have imagined they could survive and they've actually even thrived so that they feel stronger they've kind of realized lots of the kind of bullshit that they cared about in the past they couldn't give a monkeys about 
and the things that they choose to put their attention and time to and energy is much more meaningful, much more satisfying and purposeful. And their value of the love of the people they have in their life, they give real um, intentional um, time to and they kind of recognize how much that matters. And they actually recognize their mortality. And so then they, their relationship with life is enhanced too. So there are many reasons for it. Um, and all of that they would say is like growth. And so there is certainly a parallel that if we could ever really face this and what it means to us and what it's done to us, but do the work and then make some changes, structural changes and societal changes of inequalities, all the different things um, and planet and all of those things, then, then we've learned something from it that is really worthwhile. And I think people are talking about it. You know, after 9-11, everyone said, you know, we're going to build a better world. 2008, people said we're going to build a better world. And we never did because we don't like change and we much prefer stick to the kind of boring, not the boring, the kind of discomfort of the familiarity, no, the kind of toxicness of the familiarity than dare the fear of, of change and engaging with, with the unknown. But it is what we need to do. Thank you. <laughs> I feel that's a very good place to end. It is 31 minutes past eight. Oh, I'm sorry we didn't answer more questions. Um, if people want to kind of ask me questions on my Instagram page, then do. Um, I can see some of the questions here. I might be able to answer them, but I'm not sure I can. Um, but do go to Judas Amulet M at Judas Samuel MBE and ask me the questions and I will give you an answer. And of course, we've been discussing very weighty, meaty topics, haven't we? So it, it, it's, a lot to, it's a lot to grasp, but all of it is in the book. <laughs> mm, yeah. And I hope everybody that you've got something, whatever it is, because you must have come with wanting something if you signed up for this. So even if it's only a small morsel, I hope you've got something that you can hold on to that can help you for tonight or tomorrow and going forward in your life. And Kathy, you're a wonderful, wonderful interviewer. Thank you so much. I love it. <laughs> and thank you, Cheryl, for putting on the event. It's a total pleasure. Thank you. Yes, Julia, you were due to come, weren't you? Um, literally the day before the government uh, uh, locked us all down. So we were so near to doing it in the flesh, so to speak. So um, as you say, Zoom's not quite the same. It's maybe maybe not as good, but I mean, it's been it's been absolutely privileged to, to host this event and uh, hear you talk. So thank you so much. Thank you. And as most people know, the book, um, you know, This Too Shall Pass, we've got signed copies. And uh, I think a lot of you have got your book included in your ticket. But if not, we, we do have extra copies if you uh, know of anyone that might uh, find the book useful. And we've also got signed copies of uh, Kathy's latest book, uh, Dear Reader. So, it's a wonderful book. It's a fabulous book. So thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. And, uh, you know, thank you, Kathy. That was an excellent interview. Thank you so much. And, of course, a huge thank you to, to you, Julia. Um, what a very special evening. Uh, so, so insightful and interesting. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Night-night, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.